All right, hello, intro to journalism and new media. It is our first day back. This has been very difficult, like I said in my messages. It's a fluid situation. I'm going to do my best to get these videos out to you. Keep expecting updates from me. Um, this is crazy. I've never seen anything like this before. This is very unique. Um, so I'll do the best I can. I will keep you informed. I'm still learning a lot. From an online standpoint, um, I've never taught a class online, and all my resources are online sources to learn how to teach online. So I'm doing the best I can. I will keep you updated. I will stay in touch with you. I'll probably be throwing, throwing some discussion boards out there, um, but I hope everyone is safe. I hope everyone's family is doing well, and we're this is a difficult time, and uh, but we will get through this and. Uh, so here is the first uh, video. It is the basics of news writing. Um, ba basically, the biggest thing to learn from this is the inverted pyramid. It is the basis of how you're going to learn how to write. Um, it's going to take a while to learn, but here's your introduction to it and other aspects of the, of the basics of news writing. So good luck, and we will I'll, and I'll see you on the other side. All right, so today we're going to start on the basics of, of news writing. This is going to be different than writing for a research paper or an essay. You're going to learn how to really write clearly, communicate important information to your art audience. All right, you bet. You have to remember. You have, we start writing before we start writing. We have to remember to always focus on your audience. Audience centric. Be audience centric. That's why we're doing this. It always has to be. And in anything you write, it has to. You have to hammer that into your into your head. All right, we're going to do some things here. We're going to learn about uh, approaches to what are called leads, those first sentences that uh, hook your, uh, your your readers. And we have to be able to not only write a good lead, but we have to know when there's a good or bad lead. All right, um, we're going to learn about the writing the story using the five W's and the one H. Well, I know you already know that. Um, and we're going to use uh, the inverted pyramid, and you're going to see that um, you're going to find different types of quotes in here and understand why we use uh, attribution. Um, it's important when you're when you're a journalist. Uh, is, we're going to learn about that too. All right. And like I said, we're going to use the inverted pyramid. We're going to focus on what the audience needs to know. And well, you have to understand what uh, doesn't matter, what your source thinks is the most important. There's a lot more important things to write about. We're here. We're here. We're going to use the inverted pyramid. This is the inverted pyramid. It puts the most important details at the top. And he's using as many of the five W's and the one H as possible. Then as the story proceeds, they fill in some more facts. And then to give a to give a more complete picture, that's the middle. Always kind of like remember my hook on meat and potatoes, wrap it up. So yeah, so there's your meat and potatoes, the middle of it. And then the bottom is the stuff that, yeah, you can put it in there. It's not the most important stuff. It's also in a pyramid, so that's when the editors uh, look at it. They go, they go from the bottom up because they they know that that's the first stuff uh, that writers know. That's the first stuff that's getting cut out. Okay, so you can put it stuff in there if if, if you want. Um, it's not crucial if it doesn't make it. It's uh, that's why this pyramid is so important. You get the most important stuff on top, then then the other stuff to support that helps. But it's not as important there than the bottom stuff. Stuff, yeah, we can have it, but it, if it gets cut out, it's not a big deal. All right. So you know, have, first and foremost, we have to uh, in your mindset it is using this formula. Is it a formula? Yeah, but it's uh, an important formula that it, it takes a little while to learn. But as you do it and do it again, it'll become second nature. Okay. Now here's the example from the book, and they use it quite a bit, but it works very well. Um, this is a sample press release. Get used to it because you're going to be in the, being a journalist. You're going to get a heck of a lot of press releases. Um, and for those of you who want to do PR, this this class can help you. Um, so you can make a more journalist friendly press release, so they don't have to sift through it. But that's not always going to be the case. So that's why this is in, this is quite important to uh, to understand. All right, so you know, because it's your job. All right, it's your job to sift through what what they give you, and when you use the uh, inverted pyramid, 
It's to compose the best possible article, article that will inform your readers best. Okay, so now we see obviously a fire and someone was hurt, but they gotta have it all around. They, and this is basically a press release from a fire department, and they put it in a way that they focused on themselves first, which makes sense. They have information there that matters to them and probably has something to do with their official reports. So that's why you're seeing ladder trucks and pumper 32. And they, they have a certain thing uh, process they go forth with when they have to fill out fire reports and stuff like that. And these are important information that they have to fill out. So that's the mindset they're coming from. Doesn't really work for what we're doing. So just understand that depending on where your press releases are coming from, there's a reason to why why they uh, they prioritize certain things that we as uh, j journalists don't. Um, they have what they the information they need and they present in the way it works best for them. We have to take that same information and tweak it in a way that works for us so, uh, to best uh, service our audience. Okay, so basically, you think about this, and it's hook them. Meat and potatoes, wrap it up. Okay, most important fact here is Jim Smith. All right, he was ser seriously injured. He's at the hospital. He's in critical condition. All right, because of the fi fire. There is the who and the what. So Jim Smith hurt in a fire, critical condition at, at a medical facility, they call it. And then, so then where? 411 Cherry Street. Okay, we might say just Cherry Street. We might put in 411 Cherry, South Cherry Street. Um, news does it a little different. We go the 400 block of South Cherry Street. Um, you, definitely from a, from, that, from a local news standpoint, you'll hear the whatever block. In the uh, in newspapers and stuff like it, uh, print, they will tend to more give the actual address. So that, that'll be more appropriate in this instance. Also, uh, let's see. When? It was about 5 p.m. Uh, so it's 5.11 p.m. Uh, about 5 p.m., I said they got a, uh, a, f a phone call from 911, so we can assume it's about 5 p.m. on a Tuesday. And then how and why, we so we know, we not, might not always know what happened, but we do in this case. The how and why is because, uh, because uh, Jim Smith, uh, he lit, Jim Smith uh, lit a cigarette near a leaky gas stove and it exploded. Then you have lots of other information. The next step I would take, um, I would go fire department arrives to find smoke. Then what the fire fighters did to control the fire should probably come next. I'll uh, mention that the wife and the daughter, of uh, his wife Susie, his daughter Jane, were unharmed. And then uh, the next thing is uh, monetary damages that uh, follow uh, that. Um, because it's, you have the information, it's interesting the fact that you got all that in such a quick period of time isn't the norm it usually takes a, might take a little while for damages to come out but if you have that information then that then you would go after making sure the wife and the daughter are okay and then you bring up the damages the number of bedrooms it doesn't really matter we're talking about three bedroom one bath but this is a real estate ad no one cares about that also the uh the types of vehicles, in this case, not really all that important. No one really cares about that. That's one of those things the firefighters care about because it probably has something to do with how they fill out the reports. They have to probably list, oh, what, how, who went and what equipment was used and stuff like that. So they tend to put that stuff in there. Uh, not usually all that important, but no... Uh, so, sometimes some things happen where a special vehicle or piece of equipment is brought in and that can sometimes warrant, uh, warrant uh, mention in an article, such as you know, a medical chopper is brought in because they have to get the, get the victim of whatever happened so quickly to, to the nearest hospital or, or a specific hospital that has certain equipment that others don't or... So sometimes when there's a really bad car wreck, then you can and sometimes they have to use the jaws of life um, to, to get the, the people out of there. And they, we, we tend to use that as well. So it, sometimes in extreme circumstances, it warrants it. Here, they just were listing what was there. So it doesn't really 
matter in this case. First and foremost, remember it's about the audience. Why should the person care? Why is it important? It's always the most important part of the hook'em. Why should people care about any story? Okay, that's that's always the most important thing. And what's in it for me? Um, lots of times, uh, the writers and journalists they think big picture. They sometimes forget well, why should these people care. So you always have to think of that when you're writing a story. So the important part is, especially if we think about the story we just saw, how does it? How does that fire? impact the average person well they, the 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 possible impact of that story is well he, he, the person was a smoker had a leak of gas uh the stove the oven or the stove had a leaky gas uh, was a gas leak there and you know that could happen to anyone um you know it, it was a fire a fire fires can happen um that's something and so that 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 could possibly impact any number of people, but that could easily happen to any number of other people out there. So, and you know, somebody got hurt, there's something happened. It could be in the neighborhood of that specific, uh, uh, of a one specific reader, it could be right around the corner. So that impacts them. Uh, maybe maybe they knew the person. That could possibly be it. Um, it could be you know, a friend of their kids or a parent of a uh, their friend or something like that. Um, it could be any number of, uh, especially when you're talking about the local level. Um, so that's why any number of those uh, pieces of information could have um, helped um, or could have impacted a specific reader. It depends on the reader. But as first and foremost, someone died. Well, someone, first and foremost, in that is someone got hurt. There was a fire. It was local. Um, this is the, you know, this is the, uh, the information that you got from it. And depending on the, who's reading it, it, it Certain aspects might have certain meanings to certain people. So, uh, so also when you when you're writing your story, not just with in this story, but any story, always remember what the impact is of these stories on the people that are reading them. It could be gas prices, it could be mortgage rates, it could be credit card rates, it could be traffic. Maybe there's a road construction going on, and if people, and there's a big rework of of the roads or something. How does that affect the average person? What does the average person have to do? Does the person have to uh, have to make an alternate route? I mean, these are the things you have to connect the dots to. You have to think of well, what these certain um, stories, how they affect the people. Um, there's a new arena being built. How does that affect the everyday person's bottom line? In that case, are their taxes going up? Is, you know, is, is it going to cause traffic problems in the area? Is you know is there going to work going to be done? I mean, you have to you have to look at it and that you have to bring up those important factors that may Im impact people, the readers' lives. All right, now what we have to do is build a lead, and you're going to build the lead from the inside out. That lead sentence, uh, the lead is the thing that hooks your reader into that story. So this is the part where you hook them. Okay. And a couple of different ways uh, to do it. We still have our five W's, what, where, when, who, why, and the one H, how. So what happened, where did it happen, when did it happen, who is it about, why, and how. How did it happen, here's your event. And you have to kind of prioritize. Uh, what are the, every story is a little different. The characters are different, the, the situation is different. The one thing that is most important is, is, is a lot of the, is the impact. Why is this important? What makes it important? And every story is different. You have to be able to prioritize which is the most important fact here. All right, and that's by case by case scenario. Yeah, you're still using a formula, but within that formula, it's important to understand that journalism is a flexible medium. All right, you're going to use a formula, but every event is different, every story is different, and you have to be flexible with it by being able to prioritize which is the most important. Okay, so basically the, you're the whole point of the lead, you want to create what is called a single sentence paragraph, anywhere from about 25, 35 words, and you want to capture, get, get those elements. You know, probably, it's probably not going to be able to fit into one sentence. If it takes a couple sentences, it's fine, a few sentences, but it's making sure the most important stuff is at the top. The whole heart of the story is at the top. So don't write never-ending run-on sentences just to make, oh, there's a lead, so it all has to be one. No, you're still going to write quick, it's going to be clear, it's going to be coherent, 
it's gonna it's gonna make it's gonna make sense and, and it's gonna be easy to read. You have to make sure it's easy to read. But you want to get it there in that first that the lead in the first chunk of that uh, first bit top of the story. So top top is hook them. So that's where you want to hook them. So just understand it's probably it might take a couple sentences to get to get your lead, and then then you figure out the the other W's or the H depends on the story. And once again, you're remembering it. You're still using this within the pyramid, the importance, most important stuff on top, middle stuff that supports in the middle, bottom is the other stuff that you can include, but that stuff you don't really necessarily need. All right, so, so now I just told you some things about prioritizing when you're creating a lead, but there's another way to think about it, uh, building a lead from what they call the inside out. You're starting off at the core, and then you're building upon that core. So what's the most important thing is at the core, then the next layer is the next important, and the next layer is the next important, so on and so forth. So think of it as like the Earth, and the Earth's core is the most important, then they have the next layer, and it's a, a series of layers to that story. And the, the least important uh, aspects of that story are the ones in the most, in the outer layers of that uh, that circle or that core or that planet, however you want to do it. So layer after layer after layer, the so more ex external layers are the least less important uh, facts here. What this helps you do is the the focus, giving you uh, the you know, your readers focus uh, on what the most important thing is to your readers. At the at the, at the heart of it, what's the uh, what's the at the heart of it? Who did what to whom or what had happened that's so important? Why does it impact me or the world or whatever? Well, and that's where you first start off, at, whatever that story is. So in this case, in this example, it's a sports uh, example. They show the Cleveland Caval Cavaliers won the, the NBA championship, which is a really big deal because then the next thing you see, if you know anything about Cleveland, they don't win too many championships very often for a city, uh, title in 52 years. So that's... That in its in itself, anytime a, in this case, a championship. If it's a city that hasn't won a championship long, that's usually the next thing you always hear. Especially if when it's a city, not just the team itself, but the city. It might be just the team, so that might be its second. Maybe the, maybe the Indians or the Browns had won a championship before that, but they hadn't. But um, maybe the Cavaliers hadn't won a championship in a long time. It all depends on the situation. But here, that's that's the next uh, most important thing, and then you know how, uh, when you know well, what and you know, and and then as you go out, um, so they won the championship first title in fifty two years. What are how they did it? You know, did they sweep? Did the did the you know was it a seven game series? Who starred that helped them do that? Lots of things like that. And then it's, and that's how we see you know how uh, and in this case it is they came back from a three one deficit to be, to be to defeat the Golden State Warriors and then maybe another one oh uh, next thing uh, it might be uh, oh along the way the next layer might be uh, LeBron James scored uh, averaged uh, forty five points a game in those next uh, three games to overtake them. From the win the championship, and then maybe at the end, oh, the, the another layer might be oh, the championship uh, parade is next week down Main Street in uh, in Cleveland, and, and that would be your last thing. Okay, now we have the different types of leads, and the first type of lead is the summary lead, and this was the lead I was talking about before when we we're talking about the fire before. This is basically taking the five W's and the one H and trying to prioritize the the highlights the facts of that uh, of that specific of the highlights of facts of that story and uh, organize it in a way that it 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 hooks your it it hooks your readers so that's what the summary lead is that's what the summary is the one that just highlights the the the, the top facts of it not necessarily not every story is necessarily going to have a summary lead it depends uh, what the what what the story is. So each story, you got to figure out which lead, depending on the nature of the story, that's the type of lead you'll use. Summary lead works in a lot of instances, but know that this one isn't necessarily 
what you're going to use every single time. And that's why I'm listing the different types of leads. So you do know which one works best for which situation. Now the next one is name recognition lead. Uh, name recognition leads, it's in, it's in the name itself. Um, that's, you know, what's a big part of, uh, of, of the news? It's famous people, either political or music or athletes or any, whatever reason these people are famous. Some people are famous for no reason. Which is sad, but it's the it's 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 the truth. Uh, so in this case, the person who was involved in this story is the most important aspect of that story. So so it, it depends on what the story is. So for in the example, in the example the book gives is Ryan Lochte. He was a famous swimmer um, during the Rio de Janeiro Olympics a few years back. There were four athletes involved in a uh, in in a in a possible crime. They were getting it was after hours. They got involved in uh, some things they probably didn't shouldn't have gotten involved with. Something happens all across the country, so most of the times it's it's not a big deal. Uh, some people get involved, get a little get a little uh, drunk or inebriated, and. Uh, some things happen, and most of those times you never really hear about. Sometimes you will if something big happens or extreme damage or someone gets hurt really badly or even worse. But most of the times you don't hear about a lot of that, but you will hear about when it's out, out, when it's uh, Ryan Lochte, the former uh, Olympic, Olympic swimmer who was uh, well-known, and it happened at a big place such as the Olympics. So that's, that's a... Uh, that's a big deal. Lochte won 12 Olympic medals, so that that was uh, that was a very big deal, um, and that's where you get the that's uh, name recognition. You know, it's there were you know, the three other guys involved, but nobody really knows who they were. Well, they knew who Ryan Lochte was. Unfortunately, in this case, it it orbited around him, but that is a the name recognition lead is wi widely used to this day. Okay, the next type of lead that we have here is the interesting action lead. And it says, odd actions or strange occurrences are interesting. They are. Um, what happens is more important than who did it. Sometimes people do pretty crazy things. You don't hear about it too often. Who really did it in this case because it isn't a famous person doesn't matter as much. That the name might get mentioned. Sometimes it doesn't. It's more the <laughs> what the craziness that occurred. And sometimes things are crazy that happen in remote locations but still get the attention of uh, national media and especially with the web the way it is today, just spreads like wildfire. So, so that's what the, these are, the interesting action lead, the, the what matters uh, more than who in this case. In the example they have here is the 27-year-old man told place he never really meant to blow up the Main Street Quickie Mart when he used a lit cigarette to kill a spider near a running gas pump. It was an accident, and in, in, if, you, if it's in quotes, never really meant to, so that you know, it's, that was a quote. But he blew up he blew up, up a Quickie Mart, which is like a it's, it's a convenience store. Try to kill a spider uh, near a running gas pump. That doesn't sound so smart when you think about it, but if you're going to be in this industry, you're going to realize it. human intelligence can sometimes be an oxymoron. And that's just reality. There are a lot of goofy people out there who do things that aren't so bright. And uh, working in, the, in this industry, you'll hear about a lot of those types of stories and just make you shake your head, but you still got to get the salary. Next type of lead we're talking about is the event lead. Uh, the event lead is for meetings, it could be speeches, news conferences, and it's focused more on what happens, not merely, you know, it's, it was there. But, okay, great. That's the most important thing. The event, what, what happened at this event? That's why people care. Once again, going back to audience focus, the news that comes from this meeting, comes from this newscast is what matters. Why? Because it affects the people that this meeting was about. The, whatever the, the point was to that meeting affects people, and that's why it's important. It's the impact. Once again, you're seeing the impact. So let's take a look at an example of a uh, not-so-great lead and a uh, better lead. Here we have um, Johnsonville City Council. The Johnsonville City Council held a meeting Tuesday to discuss increasing overnight parking rates. That doesn't really tell you too much. It just means, oh, yeah, they talked about it. There's no real, 
there's no real consequence in there. Nobody cares. There's no impact. Basically, they, they, from reading that that statement there, it says, oh yeah, they had the uh, city council had a meeting. They talked about overnight parking rates, but did not discuss one consequence from that. And there were consequences to that. So that's the main reason why that's just not very good. Okay, let's let's one uh, next one is better. Overnight parking rates in Johnsonville will double in the next year. The city council decided Tuesday. That's better. I, I'm not thrilled with the comma city council decide Tuesday. Um, I think there may be a better way to write that. Maybe these are my, uh, eh, from a print standpoint, it's probably pretty good. Remember, I'm from uh, Broadcast News, so it's a little different. We would probably do it a little differently. But that's still a much more solid lead than the previous one. Here, you know, the, fir the first thing you hit in here is parking rates are doubling. Overnight parking rates are doubling in Johnsonville. That's the impact. Boom. You hit people over the head with it. Um, it's doubling in the next year. That's a huge consequence for a lot of people. The other one doesn't tell you much of anything. And so they had a meeting. They talked about parking. That, that, that's just terrible. I mean, you you want to hit the impact over an, uh, right people over the head with it. And the second one does that much better. And who did it and when it happened. Okay. And then you thought, then you go into the details after that and the rest of the uh, within the rest of the uh, article. So here's another event lead example. Let's uh, take a look at this. The bad one, Senator Jane Gowan spoke at Big State University on Tuesday about the problems associated with student loan debt and what it will do to students throughout the country. Okay, once again, very general. And that might work in a paper or an essay, but for news, it's not hitting what you really want to hit. You're not getting the impact right away. You're, wait, you're having your readers wait to find out the main push of that story, the whole point, the impact of the story, and that you cannot do that. Always hit them with the impact first. Impact first, hook them, hook them, hook them, okay? Student loans will lead to a debt bomb that could dwarf the mortgage crisis unless the federal government steps in, Senator Jane Gowan said Tuesday during a visit to Big State University. Much better. Why? Because once again, you hit people over the head with the impact. Student loans. Now, that, that that hits you guys. That hits me. I just graduated my MFA. That would definitely um, definitely hit me, and I and I I'm doing the whole mortgage thing too at the same time with the student loans. So uh, anyway, uh, but yeah, so you're seeing the impact right here is what's most important, as opposed to what this does. This is just once again, it's generic. Doesn't really help you. Always remember the impact. Hook the people. What's the big impact? from that story that you will put in that story and with that event lead, the, what happened from that meeting. Yeah, the meeting happened, but what was the thing that really, that, that what was the big development from that meeting that makes the most news, that is the most, has the most impact on you, your possible readers. And then there's the uh, second day lead. Second day lead is kind of a misnomer. It's um, a developing story. Sometimes stories are not just one event and done. Sometimes there are many levels and a continuing story as things go on um, and more develops, developments happen to that story. The newest information will go up top. Then it has to go back to whatever other stories that may, uh, other details of the story to catch people up. So that's a lot of time, a lot of times when you'll read, yeah, they, you, people may know about this story from previous things, but you can't necessarily assume that you go in thinking that people have some sort of knowledge of that story and but if they don't this part the second part so say it's a uh, crime or murder or something and uh, new information pops up and it's an ongoing story the newest information say the uh, the, the person is caught or the person's up on trial and they, they've, they've come down with the verdict or any number of other things, however you are in the story, you always start off with the most, the newest bit of information, then you go to other previous information just in case um, people might not necessarily know, you want to tie it back. The second day lead is the newest information, then you do a little bit of exposition after that. And it, these stories could keep being updated and changed, and you have to find that right amount of uh, change of what you're putting in there. So, 
Second day leads can be a little more complicated, but that's with an ongoing story. And chances are, if you, you might have to do, if you've started on a story, they may have you continue with that story because you already have a background with it, you have the information with it. So that's usually when the story does develop like that and there's more chapters, quote unquote chapters of the story, uh, you're probably the best person to keep con continuing on with that story. Now what we have to do is we have to make sure we know we can see a bad lead when it's there. And what do we need to do to fix it? Um, it's important to know how to write a good lead and the different types of leads. But there's a few different types of leads that some people, when they're trying to be creative and trying to mix it up a little bit, they quote unquote try to get a little cute and don't don't do that because then there's there's lots of problems with that when you're writing. You don't want to get cute and and, and sometimes what can happen is uh, uh you can wind up insulting people like you leads. Sometimes uh, people uh, what they do with uh, you leads. Sometimes people feel like they're being told what to do. People, do you like to being told what to do? I know I don't. Well, sometimes when and you might not be. You might, that might not be your intention. You're just trying to be creative, but it can rub people the wrong way. It, it gets in more problems um, than they're worth. Also, it, it doesn't really do the job of what a good lead is supposed to do. When you're doing a you lead, um, it, it can be dangerous. Don't assume you know what people should do, okay? You're not an advocate. It might seem like a good idea, but once again, it goes to being neutral, it goes to being objective. He's got to put that out there and give people the option of knowing where and when they have to, to, to do this thing. And here in this specific, uh, in this specific example, we have a bad lead. Um, the Alpha Beta the Alpha Beta fraternity is sponsoring a blood drive Wednesday, and you should donate a pint for the cause. You know. Like I said, people don't like being told what to do. Um, it's like you know, go away. You know, maybe we don't have time. Maybe I, you know, maybe there's some reason they can't do that. Or you're trying to basically tell them what to do. People don't like that. If they do it and they hear about it, give them the option. Okay. Once again, when it comes to assumptions, in this instance, it, you you shouldn't assume what people should do. There could be any number of reasons. Why they can't do it? They could have a blood issue. They might go want to do something, so do another blood drive someplace else. Um, there's so other, so many other options. Once again, you're assuming, you're telling people what to do. You're 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 not supposed to be an advocate. You're not supposed to tell them uh, what they should be um, doing. Uh, this is this is this is probably the biggest. This is one of the biggest reasons. You should not tell. Uh, should not be an advocate for this specific group. Yes, is it a good? Is it a good event? Does it help people? Yes, absolutely. But you, you being a journalist, have to remain neutral. So that's the reason. And we do see a better version. Alpha Beta Fraternity is sponsoring a blood drive Wednesday, and students interested in donating should come to the union between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. So here we are. You're still getting people. You're still telling people about the blood drive. You're telling them when, you're telling them where, but you're not telling them that they should do it. They're saying, if you're interested, this is where you have to go when you have to do it. If you're interested, you're letting those people decide for themselves. You're not telling them you should do this or you should do that. If interested, see, there's a big difference between that. Then you have the question leads. Now, once again, you're getting cute. Um, if you're a good journalist, we're a conduit for information to the public. Um, those questions, they, uh, they come from questions that we ask as interviewers and uh, to, to get information to build that story. Um, and in that, within the course of that, we're supposed to answer the questions for the readers. This can create problems. You can consult people with this. It's basically, uh, it's what's called a straw man approach, where you basically already know the answer. Don't ask a question, to, and just to be cute and to be stylish and to be what they call, what you think is creative, but is, is almost in, in a way insulting your, your audience. And you really don't want to do that because you already know the answer. All right. So it's, it's something you really don't want to do. 
and also on to understand this when you ask the question uh, every you know every reader might not have the same answer you know, like, so let's let's kind of look in here here's an example it's from the book who wouldn't want to live in a luxury residence hall in the heart of campus with free parking and a 24 7 food service that's the question a local developer is asking of students at northern university as he opens up his dream dorms project this week it's right there it's like who wouldn't want to live there might be a lot of people who wouldn't want to live in that maybe like someone likes simplicity you know maybe they don't need all that maybe it costs more money and they can't uh, afford it uh, it, it could be any number of things maybe it's not just not their thing so you're you're completely you're completely alienating a whole section of your readership by doing that maybe people are just happy with where they're living and they don't need all those things uh, so you you're, you don't want to do that um, once again you're just like oh who wouldn't want to do this you're, it's quite arrogant to think that um, and you're being kind of a in a way kind of an advocate in a way with that and it's 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 just it's just not a good approach to take with it's just not a good approach to take with your readers here's a better one dream dorms a luxury residence hall in the heart of campus opens this week and offers students at northern university an alternative to the college's standard housing options the project's developers say so you see it's different it doesn't ask people oh Whoa! What crud a crazy person wouldn't wanna wouldn't wanna live here? I mean, it, it just puts it out there. Here's an option. It's being offered, um, and it kind of gets it's gen general in the details. And if people are interested, they can look up what what the details are on their own, or maybe um, it, you might have actually that's just the leads up. Um, they've that's also a good way to say, hey, if you've caught them there, then once you write, go into the that's just the lead. You go deeper into the, uh, you go deeper into the article. Then you put in those other details of what that entails. So you've hooked them, and but you haven't you haven't put it that that quote unquote cute question aspect. And in a way, you're, you're like I said, you're alienating people. This way, you're not alienating people. You hook the people. To see those who might be interested would keep reading and see what the details, what that means. Because then you're also, with those general statements, you are setting up the, the middle part of your article. Okay, now we also have quote leads. Quote leads can sound cool. Oh, I'm going to drop in. I'm going to start the whole thing off with some historical figure with some massive profound quote. Because this makes me think this this story I'm thinking about makes me think of that. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna be cute and I'm gonna really hit people over the head with this this mind blowing quote. Don't do that. And you're sounding you're sounding arrogant. You're sounding presumptuous. It's you know, no, <laughs> just don't do that. Um, lots of times when people do this, the original quote may have been given in some in a totally different sort of context and to use it with some other totally different event just does not give it just takes away from that original quote All right so yeah they it's nice they're nice quotes and it's nice to know them and it's nice to hear about them but don't really just don't use them in this and especially when you're writing a lead especially when you first get started and no it just really doesn't work it's it is over the top it's, it's it's like it says it's ridiculous or hyperbolic you know it, it, it just doesn't really make too much sense we see here as Mahatma Gandhi once said an error does not become truth by reason of multiplied propagation and I know Mahatma Gandhi probably didn't say it exactly like that but you know and then he started talking about that's something the Smithville School District learned the hard way after having a, to correct 2,000 standardized tests by hand once the answer key was found to be wrong so yeah that totally makes com a complete relationship there with there's a total relationship there with Gandhi and then teachers have to have to correct 2,000 tests because the answer key was wrong there's totally relation there relationship there hey, no and they th they were just trying to be cute. Don't don't be cute. Be careful when you try to use uh, quotes. Um, you think, oh, this is a great quote. Don't lead off with it um, because people need some context with it. They're not going to understand what the, the 
what the story is. Um, they, they, you could shock them, scare them away, um, depending on the nation, nature of it. So be, be careful with that. And now we also have the, uh, once again, there's our friend, the inverted pyramid. Remember, you start off with the who, what, where, uh, when, why, and how, um, as much as you can at the top of that. Then you got the middle part with some more supporting information and the stuff. Yeah, if you can put it in, put it at the bottom. If you can keep it, great. If you can't, that's fine too. It doesn't take away from uh, the story of get rid of it. That's why it's at the bottom. So then the editor can cut it out. Now, well, now all that's important because you, you have to make choices you every, for every story. You have to make choices to see what is the most important thing. It's, if you, When you're creating your article, you have to prioritize, and that's part of it. Okay, so you wrote your lead. You're happy with your lead. Now what you have to do is support that lead. All right, you, You've hooked them. Okay, We've done the first part. Remember, hook them, meat and potatoes, wrap it up. You've hooked them. Now what we have to do is support what that first bit of that article. You got them hooked in. Let's bring them in more. This is where we get more details. So when you're writing, make sure when you're writing the, the middle, the body of this article, that the information that you're putting in there is further supporting what you put in those, that lead sentence or lead couple of sentences to hook your reader. You want them to keep going. You want them, you don't want them to feel cheated. The reader has decided to continue on with this journey of reading that article. You've hooked them in. You want to live up to your responsibility as a journalist by giving them all the other details to that story that you that you hook them in with that main lead. It's also important not to get off on tangents. It's easy to get off on tangents, especially if you're dealing with certain stories. There could be conflict within there. You've gotten quotes. How do I fill in the quotes? You have to make sure whatever you wrote in that lead, that little lead part, the things that you are writing in the body support that you don't get away from what was put in that lead. Now, if there's conflict or some some sort of conflict with that, then you have to somehow put that into the lead. It's somehow in that lead, that's part of the story. You find a way to work that in, and then that then you give a more full, uh, more full and complete article. Now, this is really important. Write in small chunks. When you read an article of this nature, there's only a couple sentences. There's a sentence here, there's a sentence there. You want to keep keep the flow going. You don't want to overwork your reader. And it can be intimidating to read this big, long, massive mess of words, and people are going to sometimes be dissuaded from reading. You know, they're going to, I'm not going to read all this. You got to keep it simple, make it easy to read. Don't get too flowery with your with your words. Remember, you're telling a story. You know, kind of think of it think of it as a way you're telling a story to a friend. All right, and as best you can, well, with using all the journalistic rules and styles that are expected. And also, very important, very very important here. Make sure you know when to stop. Editing is a huge part of writing these stories. You have to know when you have. You have to know. How much is enough? Did you did you support your lead? Did you get all of your information in there? That's necessary, but you have to keep it brief. You got to keep it succinct. Okay, really, really important to remember that. Which finally brings us to overly general, hyperbolic, many people, some people, nobody, everybody. Using these in leads or within the context of your article, it may sound neat and might sound cool and but it just doesn't work. Uh, it's it's way too general. You're a journalist, and you're jur being a journalist. You're responsible to being as accurate as possible. And making broad generalizations like that takes away from the your credibility as a journalist. You want to be reserved and professional in your delivery. Phrasings like this, especially within that lead, it takes away from the story. This goes back to being a straw man lead. Now there's a way to write this in a way. Th that you can still focus on that underdog aspect within the body of the article, talking to people within the game. They could be players, they could be coaches, it could be fans um, in their response and showing their surprise. That's perfectly fine. Um, but to do that as your lead, it just doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work. It's wait, 
It's way too vague. And you don't know. You don't know nobody thought that they could win. Maybe 99% of people didn't think they could win. But you're making it. So that's right there. It's factually inaccurate. Right there. It's factually inaccurate. So you can't really do that. You use data. You use research to back up statements. That would better deal with this. Look at it. Nobody thought Smithfield State's team would break a 56-game losing streak against the top-ranked Auburn Tigers. That doesn't include everybody, okay? That means every single person, 100%, thought that. And there's you don't know that for sure. You didn't go out and ask every single person. So that makes it factually inaccurate. There are ways to focus on the rarity of this situation, of the upset quality with it. You do that by interviewing people that are involved with the game, such as coaches and players and fans, and seeing their reaction to this. You can find, you can look things up, maybe look at the odds of the of the game beforehand. What was the spread? Did they was there even a spread? You can look at the actual history uh, of those things. These are the things and pieces of information you have to include to form that major upset feel for this. So avoid general things. Many people, this people, some people, because this is not actual resource. Unless you have actual resource with hard numbers, you don't just, you just don't, in general, just don't make these broad general statements. If you have real numbers, then use those real numbers, but still avoid using descriptive words like many, none, some, because that doesn't really tell the story. And the whole point of you there, being there is to tell the story. Okay, now we're at quotes. How do you use quotes within an article of a story? That is essential to any good story. I mean, this is where you actually hear from the source in, in, in the story you're telling about, the players of the story. Um, it's important to know the different types and when you have to use them. We have a little word game here. To help you remember the three different types, dip, direct, indirect, and partial. All right, your direct quotes, they are usually word for word. Um, this happens uh, when it goes beyond the facts. They say something that's interesting. Your indirect quotes are not word for word. Now, sometimes you're going to have interviews or have certain bits of information that you're quoting that do not work well as a quote. But there's information in there that you're going to have to use. We'll show the, the differences between them. All right, direct quotes, you're using these when you get more than just facts. Sometimes you're you going to have a story. You're going to get some certain facts uh, about certain things. But you're also going to get opinions. All right, for the example in the book, uh, to, to show this, uh, they, they, have, they talk about the Warrenville City Council. They voted... Tuesday, it voted five to four Tuesday, and in a favor of an ordinance to sell naming rights for city parks, despite allegations of financial malfeasance. Um, and then there's a quote directly in there from someone who's against it. So you have your lead of what happened. You also have information there that's tossing basically to a quote where it talks about. Um, the financial malfeasance, and the, there was allegations of financial malfeasance, so you have a way to toss to it. So if the plan goes as kind of provides a clear case of political pocket lining, so you're, you're seeing that there. You're also going to see it when somebody says it in what they call an interesting fashion, so it's something in an interesting fashion. Um, they, you can There are some times when people are just downright blunt, and people aren't are, are, are not uh, flowery or reserved, and sometimes they just go out and say th some things that um, really wouldn't you wouldn't normally see, but sometimes it's unique. That unconventional way is expressed in a way that's uh, that that could get a laugh. It could just to the point, and it has merit there. It just is, and you'll know when it's that. Now. Your indirect quotes are different. Sometimes you're going to have things, you're going to be in situations, and in the example, in the book they have an example where an attorney is talking to a hostile witness, and there's, there's back and forth. There's question and answer, question, answer, short answer, here, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, why'd you do this? Uh, uh, Mr. La Mr. Womack, are you an associate of defendant Johnny James? Yeah. Did he ask you to kill Jane Smith? Yeah. And did you kill her? Yeah. All right. You can't really use that as a quote. But what you can do is paraphrase. So you're not going to be actually 
quoting them word for word, but you're going to take all the information that you get from the, from this very important from this very important testimony in this, and you paraphrase it to make full, complete sentences. So, convicted murderer Carl Lamack testified that he killed Smith at the request of his associate Johnny James saying James had an affair with Smith and feared it would become public. And if you read the rest of that transcript, you'll find that other inf information. It was all just one big, long sentence, and it totally wrapped up what he had said without quoting, yeah, yeah, question, yeah. Uh, so uh, you see how the indirect quote works. Sometimes you have phrases that really work um, and and have a real a real value to your story but you might not like everything else that they said it might have been only a few words here a phrase or something like that um, this is where you use partial quotes and in the example they have is the father of a sixth grader who made a phony bomb threat to avoid taking a math test called his son's quote unquote harmless fun and argued that the boy should not be suspended so you're seeing the fact that it's harmless fun. You didn't hear anything else about from that father or what he had to say. It that had value because it was a quick reference to that that little phrase and it worked within the context of it. Um, but try not to use them too much. When you use them, use them every so often. They're only supposed to be little tastes, little flavors. You know, a little bit of like it says punch there. Because there's two reasons for that. If you use it all the time, you're going to think, oh, this person can't find anybody who can put more than two or three words together. Or you can make it listen like you're, you're not any good at your job. Because all you do is use little little phrases here and there. You should be able to know when to use them every so often. And you'd be able to use the other kinds of quotes as well. Now, the next aspect we have to talk about is attributing your information. Now, this is where we're seeing where you got that information. All right, and they say said says it best. All right, uh, there are other uh, are other words. We're going to talk about those other words momentarily. W the word said does work best when you're doing this. Don't try to get too flowery. Attributing your information. Basically, all this is you saying this is who told me this bit of information. All right, this is who told me what their opinion was. Um, basically, said we use we use said all the time. That is usually the best way to do it. Um, there are other ways to do it. So I'm going to go into them in a, just a minute. Uh, some things you have to be careful when you're doing this. You don't want to misrepresent what people said. You don't know what people think, feel, or believe. So you can't assume certain things because they said certain things. Or you have to be careful when you write because you don't want to misrepresent someone in what they said. Uh, so th that could be a whole other set of problems. And then also, mind your gra grammar and common sense. Sometimes you're going to use said, sometimes you're not. Uh, be careful with it, because if you say said all the time, it's going to annoy people. Said, they said this, 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 it will annoy people. But here's some, here's some other options um, to use instead of said. Okay, you can use testified when you use testified, only if you're in court cases, hearings, stuff like that. Um, like it'd be state here, like congressional hearings or legislative hearings or real court cases or stuff like that. That's when you use testify. Don't don't use it. Oh, I'm going to use that instead of said when it's totally inappropriate. Stated. Um, this is the written form of said. It's it says uh, documents state things, people say things. Okay, so the only times I write state. It's it's a law states this a document so and that's usually a document so that that's when it's appropriate to use that so if a person said if a person has given you a quote then they said it they didn't um, they didn't state it don't use state in that in that instance announce these are only used when you have actual formal proclamations like oh the governor is announcing he 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 or she is. Uh, uh, running for another term, all right. So that's a formal proclamation, a formal announcement. Companies have announcements all the time. That's perfectly fine. Um, that's when you don't use said. Asked. You only use that when if somebody poses a question. When someone actually poses a question, then you can add, put that in there in the context of your story. And then according to according to use that really really sparingly. Be scared. Be a little scared to use that because a lot of times that makes. It seems like the source isn't credible. 
Yeah, I know you hear all the time on TV news. According to this poll, or according to that poll, yeah, people, I, th I think uh, television uses a little too much. Don't don't use that all that often. Uh, it's every so often, once again, this is very, 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 very sparely. Very, very rarely use that. And just some things to remember. I, I use a reader-centric stu structure. Remember, it's always about the reader, the impact on the reader. So you have to remember always going that. What's the most important stuff first? Goes to the pyramid. Most important stuff up top. Five W's and the H. Then you have your your middle and then your end. Remember, hook them. Meat and potatoes. Wrap it up. Then also you have your your sources. Make the best use of those quotes. Please try and avoid bias as much as possible. It's important because we're journalists and we need to get the truth out there. All right. And then practice, practice, practice. All right. Hey, keep only way you're going to get better at doing the inverted pyramid is by doing it over and over and over and over again. Don't worry, eventually it will become second nature because you will just keep doing these things over and over and over again, all right? Well, that's the end of uh, basic news writing. I hope you learned something there, and we will continue on with the next chapters, all right? I hope you're all doing well, and stay safe. Keep on keeping on, all right? Bye.